This is Nick Augustine here with Mark Scroggins. Today we're talking about pre-trial discovery. And Mark, what is this discovery stuff? So that is a uh, that is a great question. And discovery encompasses a whole lot of different things. Okay, you've got you've got written discovery and you've got oral discovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, written discovery the most common things that most people are going to deal with. At least you know having a cursory set um, that's just kind of prophylactic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, Things like request for disclosures, okay? In request for disclosures, that requires the other side to list fact witnesses, okay? So people who have knowledge of relevant facts and what their connection to the case is. You know, it's John's brother, or it's, you know, John's girlfriend, or it's, you know, Betty's boyfriend, or Betty's mother, or, or the PTA president, or, you know, that kind of stuff. It also requires them to say if they're gonna have expert witnesses that are going to be used. So you're gonna see lawyers always the uh, lead counsel on a case. So like I always enlisted as an expert on a case because I'm gonna testify as to attorney's fees, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, courts generally don't award attorney's fees, but it does happen in certain cases where um, the actions of the other party really have been pretty poor and they're part of the problem where things have been run up or it can be other issues as well. But it also comes down to, let's say, if there's going to be a child custody evaluator or if the kids have, um, let's say, if the, the kids have medical problems, so you would list doctors there that would testify about the medical conditions of the kids. Uh, you could also have mental health experts that, uh, or a child custody evaluator that's, that's going to be listed there. Also, let's say, like I represent, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, small business owners or medium sized business owners. And so what always takes place when there's a business in a divorce, right? A business valuation. So the business valuation expert is going to be listed there. And let's say that maybe you've got a forensic accountant that's going to be going in because you're trying to trace what is separate and what is community. And, and so there can be a whole lot of different issues. And those are all things that are listed in just that one document, the request for disclosures. Okay. You also have what are called interrogatories. Okay. That's just a fancy legal name for written questions. Okay. You're limited to 25 in a typical, what's called a level two case. Um, so unless you have something special, that's what it's going to be. Unless you file a motion for leave with the court to get that expanded. Mm -hmm. You have requests for production of documents, which is exactly what it sounds like. One of the first times you see that in the legal world, right? That you, you know, the layman can look at it and go, Oh, I think I actually I know, know what, what that is. They right. want bank statements and tax right. returns. Bank statements, tax returns, credit card receipts, um, little Johnny's uh, school records. You know, uh, has he been tardy a lot? Has he been missing school? I mean, all these kinds of things. Those play into it. You also have what are called requests for admissions that are statements, basically, admit or deny that you had an affair with. Um, you know, whoever, okay? So it's just statements like those. Those can be used as well. Then you've also got subpoenas, okay? So let's say that we get a number of documents uh, in discovery, but I don't trust the other party or the lawyer on the other side to have actually produce what they were supposed to. Well, odds are I'm going to subpoena records to make sure that I actually have the documents. Now it can be done for other reasons aside from that, because you can have them put in what's called a business records affidavit, and put the, have them on file with the court so you don't have to have somebody testify, say, from Bank of America to prove up these documents that they are what you claim they are, right, okay? So that's written discovery, okay? Then you have oral discovery. What's oral discovery? Well, those are depositions, okay? So most people have seen what has been portrayed to be a deposition in a movie or on TV. It's generally a little different than that. You don't typically get the witness lipping off and trying to uh, ask questions back and that being the table over. Yeah, well, I, actually, you'll, you'll find some of that every once in a while. Court but, reporters, by the way, are the most interesting jobs because they get to just, oh my. That's true, or the videographer on those. So. Yeah. Um, but that would be, let's say I was representing you in the case, okay, mm -hmm. and in a divorce case. And so your wife and her lawyer um, are there to be you and me, and I'm taking your wife's deposition. So your wife would be sitting about where I am. I'd be sitting there, you'd be sitting over there, her lawyer's over there, and I've basically got carte blanche to ask um, pretty close to anything I want to, mm -hmm. okay, within reason. I mean, if I'm talking about stuff that, you know, happened to her when she was 15 years old, um, 
you know, unless it ties into something with mental health issues or something where it can really be tied, uh, then that's not relevant. Um, you know, so, so that's what discovery is, okay? It kind of comes to another question of, then how do we use it, okay? So discovery is like what it sounds like. You're trying to discover information from the other party, mm -hmm. okay? If you are, let's say if you've got a case where one party has been the one who primarily takes care of all the financial aspects of uh, the marital financial responsibilities, okay? Clearly, he or she knows what there is and where it is, right? Mm -hmm. It is amazing how often the other spouse has no freaking clue right. at all. And no idea even how much the couple makes, how much the house is worth, right. how much the bills are. They just swipe. Well, right. And when it comes down to tax time, you know, the tax return is prepared and they're just handed it and, you know, signed. Or they've given a power of attorney to their accountant or tax preparer to be able to digitally sign the tax return for them. So they really don't have any clue. And so where this becomes problematic in a divorce case is if the other side is being less than forthcoming, which happens all the time, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you are the one that has to do the, the vast majority of the heavy lifting in a case like that because you don't know shit, right. okay? So, so you've got to be able to find out what does the marital estate look like? So you think of it like a pie, right? Okay, so first you gotta figure out what the hell kind of pie is it and what all is in the pie before you can get down to how to divide the pie. Okay, so, so that's basically what, you know, what you're trying to use discovery for. You're also using it on the kids, you know. Um, how involved have, has one parent or the other been with, uh, been with the kids? And, and how have child rearing duties been split? Or, uh, and when I say split, that doesn't mean 50-50. It means, you know, is it 199 or is it 50-50? Or is it I mean, I, you know, I don't know. And it's going to be different between a divorce case and a modification. So... Discovery is something that is needed in almost every single case unless the parties really come in thinking, you know, with, uh, hey, we've pretty, pretty much got an agreement on stuff and, um, you know, the attorney's job is going to be to look at it and let them know the pros and cons of the agreement that they have reached and then act as scrivener, okay? But otherwise, uh, it's a big part of every case. Right, because if the judge is going to have to decide something, the evidence comes from testimony and also from you know, what happens here with discovery. That is exactly right. Mark, we talked about discovery and all the different forms, how it's used. Um, let's look at what really happens then. Sure. As the attorney and the client, what can I expect? How is it all used? Sure. So, you know, discovery is something that's done, you know, not just for the hell of it. It's done so that we can figure things out about a case, but it's also, you know, the creation, or not creation, but the uh, collection of evidence that's going to be used in hearings of final trial, right? So if I don't know anything about what the parties make, if I don't know anything about my spouse's bonus plan and what she's got, let's say that we've kept everything in separate accounts, mm -hmm. okay? And when I say separate accounts, I don't mean separate property. I just mean separate accounts. Because once again, remember, everything that you, you know, the presumption is that everything you own is community. So the burden's on you to prove if it's not, if it's actually separate. So any asset, any debt acquired during the pendency of the marriage is community, right? Well, if I don't know what the hell my spouse makes, if I don't know what the bonus structure is, I mean, I see stuff, you know, on the tax return, but beyond that, you know, do they have an expense account that, you know, a lot of stuff is is run through, okay? Um, what is the matching with a 401k? Do they, have, uh, do they have a pension? Let's talk about some other things that you, you run into, especially down here. What about oil and gas royalties? Mm -hmm. You know, what about uh, where you've got a pretty heavily moneyed couple and you've got uh, commercial real estate properties, okay? And maybe, Maybe you own a piece of an LLC. Maybe you own all of an LLC that is in and out of different properties. Um, you know, maybe you've got intellectual property 
that you own. So what the hell do you do with all of that? You know, well, you got to go through discovery to figure out what it is, and One then thing based leads on to another so exactly like and puzzles. Then, that's that's exactly right. And then depending on what you learn, you know, so as a board certified family lawyer, you know, I know a lot about family law. I don't know a lot about intellectual property law. I know even less about oil and gas law. Okay. And I would say that's about on par with my knowledge of, you know, commercial real estate. Okay. So what do I need to do on that? I need to bring in an expert. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it might just be a business valuation expert. It might be a real estate lawyer. It might be an IP lawyer. It might be an oil and gas lawyer. It might be a corporate lawyer also to look at the contracts that are associated with that. You know, there are certain, there are certain organizations that are set up that are designed to try to um, prevent a spouse from getting much of anything in a divorce by, you know, creating a poison pill in the document. You know, and uh, and so there's all kinds of creativity involved. So my point is, you've got to get all this information. You've got to kind of what I do a lot of the time when we get into these other issues that I'm not an expert in is I'm bringing on other people and I'm quarterbacking it. Okay, mm -hmm. so they're you know telling me what what we need in this area, and then all of that information that we obtain is going to be used in different hearings. Uh, and at final trial. So here's a here's a perfect example of that. Okay, let's say that you owned a business that was started um, six weeks prior to getting married. Okay, and that business blows up. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, now. There might be, the other side might be trying to say, well, it was actually created, but it was funded with community property and all this. Well, let's say that you think that you can prove that that's bullshit, that it was not funded with community property funds, that it was, you know, that it was capitalized with separate funds, and so that that separate property, and you want to try to take that off the table, you don't want to be dealing with that in final trial. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, you might file what is called a motion for summary judgment. Okay, and that's where you're asking the court to make a determination as a matter of law that this business is separate property and thus it's off the table because a court can't divide separate property, right? Can only divide community. So you have to do a lot of discovery to find out just what does the other side think that they have because all they've got to do to overcome a summary judgment is create a fact issue, mm -hmm. okay? So we've got to go through the discovery process and then we put together a pretty voluminous uh, motion most of the time um, seeking a summary judgment to take that off that off the plate, okay? So that's one way a lot of this stuff is used. The other then is at final trial, okay? So let's say that, uh, you know, let's say that my fund, my fund, my wife ran a hedge fund, okay? So is she the sole owner of the hedge fund? Was it created uh, prior to or during the marriage? Uh, what did the corporate documents say? As her spouse, did I sign anything um, saying that X is the you know, fair market value of, uh, of my wife's portion of this hedge fund? I mean, because that's something that happens all the time where you know, typically you're gonna have to immediately offer that piece back to the LLC uh, in doing something like that or back to the corporation. So, uh, so there are a whole lot of moving parts, but generally the reason that we're going out to get all this is because that's what we're going to base our motions and our final trial on. I always liked mortgage applications, car loan applications, mm -hmm. credit card loan applications. It's really interesting when someone will represent their income in this snapshot, that snap. I always thought that was yeah, I mean, it is uh, it is not uncommon for someone to uh, either be more truthful in that regard or to uh, exaggerate a little bit. And then all of a sudden, you know, they say, hey, I make half a million dollars. And then all of a sudden it's, I make 56,000. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> which know, is exactly different. <laughs> exactly. Right. Mark, what's involved with discovery preparation and what is the role of the client? So, um, 
any time a client comes to me and hires me on a matter, you know, one of the things I'm going to tell them is basically it's like we're you know kind of creating a partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you're bringing the facts, and I'm bringing the legal knowledge, and together we're forming the strategy of what we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to get there. Okay, so client involvement in the discovery process is incredibly, incredibly important. Let's talk about the most obvious one, which is in depositions, okay? Mm -hmm. You're the star witness, or one of the stars, okay? It's generally gonna be you, your spouse, and then if we've got experts, you know, or other fact witnesses where there's a smoking gun, so to speak, or something like that, you know, that's really, really important. So what needs to happen? Well, you know, it is amazing to me of how many lawyers allow their clients to go into a deposition naked. You know, they don't, they don't really spend any time talking about it. And that is asinine, um, just absolutely asinine. I mean, unless you do this day in and day out, how the hell are you gonna go in and testify uh, about something? I mean, and they're, they're different things to understand. I mean, one yeah, of, why, is my, why is my lawyer objecting, but then saying, you know, you answer, can answer. You're, you're gonna answer. Well, what, what, I'm confused at this point. Well, not only that, there's a difference between, you know, direct examination and cross-examination. and. You know, people get, uh, there's a attack that happens all the time. You know, most people can't stand uh, dead air, you know, or where there's just nothing being said. So you finished your answer and the lawyer just sits there and keeps staring at you. And then all of a sudden you just start vomiting, you know, you know, bullshit, 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 which then it brings up all this other stuff. Yeah, exactly. And it brings up, it opens all these other doors that the other side's never even thought of. Okay, so there are a whole lot of things that you need to understand on the way to respond to things. Yeah. Okay, and I'm not telling you, I'm not talking about changing anything with your answers or anything that, that affects the veracity of your testimony, but I'm talking about the manner in which to conduct yourself. You know, don't come in uh, in the summer in, you know, flip flops, cutoffs, and a wife beater on to have your videotaped deposition testimony. And they almost all are nowadays. Yeah, I, I can tell you that I cannot recall a video that I have, a video, a deposition that I've not videotaped in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's important because, you know, you could have someone, you know, just sitting there and rolling their eyes and doing all kinds of stuff. Body language is important, right? Um, Reporter can't but it doesn't, it doesn't read that on paper, right. okay? But the video tells a different tells story. Different. You know, if somebody sits there for two minutes, you know, and they can't really think of anything, you might see pause, you know, on the paper, but you can see what actually is going on on the video. So it's imperative that client and lawyer have spent time together so the client understands what does a deposition encompass, okay? What is, you know, what can the other side ask? Damn near everything they want, okay? within certain limits. I mean, I can instruct someone not to not to answer, but you gotta be pretty, you can't be cavalier in doing that, okay? So uh, there are times when I will instruct someone not to, uh, not to answer something when someone's gone too far afield. Um, but you know, most, most of the time you don't run into that problem, especially not with good lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although there are plenty out there that, you know, you run into that issue with. Um, so, that is one thing, okay? Written discovery, hugely important for client involvement as well, okay? I don't know anything about your case right. aside from what you tell me until we get into discovery. So unless you tell me that dad is coming home drunk four nights a week and wants to play with a two-year-old, okay? I don't know that. So I don't know to ask questions about his drinking or drug habits or, you know, has he been, you know, throwing Junior into the air and accidentally threw him into the, into the ceiling when he was lit, you know? Ouch. Yeah, exactly. I don't know about that. That's why that is important, okay? Here's the other part. So in crafting interrogatories, okay, there are lots of attorneys out there who also, you know, just kind of send a, a form set out and don't get into, and some of the form set stuff is important. It's very important, okay? But you need to get beyond that. Uh, and that's something that we always do, okay? Um, you know, but there are others that just kind of press a button and, and go with it. Um, 
that's also incredibly important in requests for production of documents. So in the drafting side, it's very important to get the input from the client on what are the pressure points with the other spouse? Uh, what information do we really need? What have his or her actions been? Uh, what are hot buttons? You know, um, so what do you believe is really important to the other side? So that's really important from the drafting side of it. Now, when it comes to the gathering of documents, I can't gather all of your documents without your assistance, okay? I can get some of it and I can go and I can subpoena documents from this bank and you know that financial planner and that marriage counselor and all that. And I'm happy to do that, but guess what? You're getting charged for every bit of that, you know, because how do lawyers earn a living? We charge for our time. We do not produce a product, mm -hmm. right? Okay, not a tangible product, something that you can put your hands on in that regard. So you can save yourself also a lot of money by being heavily involved and gathering all of those documents. So if you can go to the bank and go back and let's say that, I wanna say like my bank, I can go online and get stuff for the last 18 months, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, let's say that you need to get stuff for three years, okay? Much easier for you to go to the bank and try to get that, and if they have to you know, put in a special order to get it, it's gonna be cheaper for you to do that. It's your time, and that's a pain in the ass, I understand that, but depending on you know, what, are you more concerned about the money you're spending, or are you more concerned about your time? You know, that's the balancing act. Right. right, whether you bring in a nice binder with a organized right. or a box of everything thrown in there because someone's going to have to go through and make sense of it all. Right, and understand, there's no right or wrong to that. I mean, we deal with both. I mean, sometimes yeah. it is just here, here's what I've got. Yeah. And that's fine. We, you know, we're five lawyers and seven paralegals. We've got the bandwidth to deal with all of that, you know, the biggest to the smallest type of deal. You save a lot of money if you don't turn stuff over like that because I don't need to have two or three paralegals on there trying to sort out what the hell everything is and where it goes and where it falls on its timeline on stuff. Okay, um, but that you know that's basically where that goes. And then by the time you get to trial, okay, you know what the story is that you're telling. Okay, and so every good trial lawyer is telling a story. Okay, generally, let's say that I represent Bob. Excuse me. So I'm probably doing two things. I'm talking about what a fantastic mother mom is, and I'm talking about uh, not that necessarily that dad is a bad dad, unless he is, um, but the shortcomings or why mom is better. So there are these parallel tracks. And then based on what the facts are of the case um, and what our theory is of the case, that is the story that I'm gonna tell. And then I use all of these documents, this huge mass that we have assembled, okay, through subpoenas, through depositions, through written discovery, okay? And those are the pieces of evidence that are used to verify the story that I'm telling to try to convince a judge or a jury to do what we're asking them to do. And what I see is what you're building is a story and credibility. Sure. And if your presentation of the facts is what's more credible, mm -hmm. that's going to help you. Well, that's absolutely true. And, um, you know, I'm glad you, you mentioned credibility because that is the most important thing whenever you testify. And remember, a response to an interrogatory is verified, meaning you are signing saying it's true and correct. So it's just like you've testified in court, okay? The most important thing is always to tell the truth. I don't give a damn how bad you think the fact is. Tell the freaking truth, mm -hmm. okay? I can deal with a bad fact. What is difficult to deal with is you've been caught perjuring yourself because then your credibility goes out the window. And once your credibility goes out the window, then why the hell should the judge believe what you're saying about this? Oh, I know I lied about it. that, but I'm really telling the truth about this. Well, you know, not a good place to be. A good place to be. No. For more information about discovery and the process, what to expect, right? All of that. Call Scroggins Law Group. Any final thoughts? You know, a lot of this can feel really overwhelming. I mean, you know, I've just been kind of with with the discussion we've had here. It's a little bit like drinking from a fire hose because it it's, it's a shit ton of information in a short period of time. Okay. So whether you hire us or you hire somebody else. 
it's important to get somebody that you feel comfortable with, that you can trust, okay? And any good lawyer is gonna walk you through that process. So make sure that you're as comfortable as you can be with the folks that you, uh, that you hire. If you've got some questions, feel free to give us a call, come in, we'll talk to you, walk you through the process, and then you can figure out what's good for you. Is it fit, is it not fit? We'll be happy to help you. Thanks so much. Have a great day.